Hey guys, welcome to chapter 16. Chapter 16 is all about cell communication. This is probably going to be one of the more difficult chapters for you this semester. So really spend some time through these lectures. Take your time, let, read through the, check, uh, the chapter, and let me know if you have any questions. Cell communication is a hugely important aspect to our lives as multicellular organism, as multicellular organisms, and it also is hugely dependent on um, applied fields such as pharmacology, etc. So it's really important that you understand these. We have three different topics in chapter 16. We have the basics of cell communication, which is topic one, and then we're going to talk about G-coupled protein receptors in topic two, and enzyme-coupled receptors in topic number three. So make sure you have a good handle on topic number one before you move on to the other two, because the other two are just basically examples of topic one. So here we are, here's our topic outline. We have a lot of stuff we're going to cover in this topic, and we only we have a few short slides, so it's really important that you take your time through these through these slides. Here's our topic objectives. As always, I let me know if you have any questions. I expect you to have these mastered by the test, and I fully expect you to bring plenty of these questions to class, so make sure that you have that and are prepared um, to discuss these more in depth. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. The first thing that we have to talk about with communication is what do we communicate with? And inside multicellular organisms, we use signals, and these can be various chemical signals, hormones, um, or other, uh, other chemical signals that are used. And there's hundreds of these signals, and every signal will tell the cells to do something different. And there's four main ways that these signals are spread throughout the body. The first of these is endocrine. Endocrine is the one you probably are most familiar with because you've probably heard of the endocrine um, system before. And this is where hormones or anything else is secreted from one cell, passed into the bloodstream, and sent to a target cell. And this can be f pretty far away in the body. It's a pretty long range signal. The next type is paracrine, and this is where signals are excreted from cells into the extracellular matrix, and these are picked up by nearby cells. So paracrine is a much more closely um, related signal uh, network, so it doesn't go nearly as far. Neuronal is ones where the nerves are passing the signals, and this one we talked about before when we were talking about um, some of those other examples we had in unit number three. And then the last one's contact dependent, and this can occur between a variety of different cells, but the one we think about a lot is, um, is immune cells. Immune cells will come by and do a co and contact cell and touch other cells to check to make sure that they're still normal, healthy cells. So make sure you understand these four um, types of signal ranges, types of communication, and um, how they work and how they differ from each other, because it's really important. So now we know how the signals are received or passed between cells. Let's talk about signal speed. Signal speed can be into, can be fast and it can be slow. It depends on what the signal is, it depends on what the cell that receives it is capable of doing, and it depends on what the process that the signal is asking for the change in the cell to do. As you can see here on the slide, there's two possible functions here. One is alter protein function, and one is to alter protein synthesis. The fast reaction is the one that can alter protein function, whereas the slow one is altered protein synthesis. And this makes sense, right? It's a lot easier for us to alter our protein function through a variety of ways, phosphorylation or degradation, depending on what we're looking for. Whereas altered protein synthesis has to go through transcription and translation before this protein is made. So it's really a balancing act. And some signals can can create both these cascades, some signals can create just one. So it just depends on what's going to happen, on what the cell needs to do. So now let's talk about how these signals are received. We have three main types of cell surface receptors that we're going to focus on in this chapter. And two of these are the focus of topic number two and topic number three. So the three surface cell surface receptors are ion channel coupled receptors, and we've talked a lot about these back in unit three. So if you're feeling a little unsure about them, please go back and check that out. I'm not going to talk about them again here. The other two are G-coupled protein receptors, or GPCRs, 
and then we also have enzyme coupled receptors and these are the other two types of cell surface receptors and they're pretty common and we're going to talk about GPCRs in topic two and enzyme coupled receptors in topic three so don't worry about them too much right this second but be aware of them so that when we get to the next topics you're prepared all right, so that leads us into the next section where we're going to talk about how cells respond to different signals. As I mentioned, is we could have one signal and it can um, target any number of different cells and create a different response at any number of different cells. And you can see this example here with acetylcholine. Acetylcholine can cause a decreased rate of force and contraction in heart cells, it can cause secretion in salivary glands, and it can cause contractions in skeletal muscles. So every cell will receive a signal and react differently to it. So it's really a balancing act and a directional um, make sure the body has to make sure that they are sending those signals to the right place otherwise we can get all sorts of dysregulation within the body and it's not only just that but combinations of cells can create different or combinations of signals can create different outcomes and you can see that here on the other graphic here so if we apply signals a b and c we're telling the cell to survive but if we add d and e we're going to tell it to divide and then to differentiate is f and g and then if we don't send anything it'll die and go through apoptosis but it just depends and once again it depends on every cell remember back we talked about some examples earlier this semester where different uh, regulators can change what the cells are going to do and what they're going to differentiate into and it's a similar concept so different signals can create different effects on different cells and it's that combination and what the cell has that helps work it um, helps develop or determine what that cell is going to do with this information it's really a lock and key type example where the key is very specific for that cell and that result is going to be very specific. So let's look at an example now. And just to be slightly confusing because so far we've been talking about cell surface receptors, we're going to talk about hormones. Now hormones, for the, um, a lot of them are lipids, which means that they can diffuse across the membrane easily. This means they don't need a cell surface receptor, they actually can use intracellular receptors. And these intracellular receptors are called nuclear receptors. These nuclear receptors um, will bind to the signal and will automatically start transcription. And that's why they're called nuclear receptors. And so they're always going to stimulate um, transcription within the cell. So remember, hormones, if they're lipid-based, can pass through that membrane without binding to the cell surface and will stimulate transcription within the body. Another example is gas, and we use gas as a drug a lot, and you, um, if you've been to the dentist, you may have experienced this yourself. And our cells will even use this process to help us rapidly ref uh, relax smooth muscles. Now gas, because it can easily pass through membranes, it is a very close and a very limited localization of effect. So it has to stay in a very small area to have this effect. So as you can see here, NO, which is nitrous oxide, can pass through the cells and relax that muscle. And this is just another example of how we use this with this endothelial cells. And this is actually how erect, um, the penis becomes erect is through this function. So this is another example of how signals pass through the cell. And as you can see here, we have the acetylcholine stimulates the release of this gas. So now let's talk about signal transduction pathways. And this is all about how that signal is passed along. So remember, we talked a lot about signal cascades and feedback loops and things like that. And that's exactly what this is. The, the signal that's coming, the extracellular signal, does not generally, when we're talking about um, receptors, pass through the membrane. All it does is bind to that re the receptor. The receptor will then pass the signal across the um, across the membrane through its protein conformation and will then act on the different parts of the cell. Now there are four main fo functions of tr signal transduction. The first is to relay a message. This is just would pass the message on to another place. Another function is to transduce or amplify. So keep passing that signal through, amplify the signal to create a greater effect. Then we have integrate. Integrate will allow us to take multiple signals together, read it and understand it, and then create an effect. And then there's the distribute, which will allow for a distribution of new um, instructions to the cell. And as you can see in the picture here, altered metabolism, altered cell shape and movement, altered gene expression, it just depends on what's gonna happen. And so those are the four types of signal transduction pathways. 
Now the signal transduction pathway has five main components. The first of these is for the signal to be received. Once the signal is received, the receptor then will then relay the message through intracellular signals into in the intracellular molecules in the body. So you can see that here. The signal is received in the red, the receptor protein is activated, which then passes the intracellular signaling molecule, which is then passing the signal to the intracellular mo signaling molecules. Then the effector proteins are going to be, uh, be turned on, which then will create that cell response. And any of these responses can be any of the four functions we just talked about with relay, relaying, transducing or amplifying, integrating or distributing. So it's important that you understand that. So there are five steps with four possible functions. Make sure that you understand this because this is huge. This is a big part of this concept in this topic. So make sure you understand these two images and what they're telling you. So now let's look at an example of signal transduction pathways. And it usually, we've talked about molecular switches before, and molecular switches will allow something to turn on and turn off. And these processes use kinases and phosphatases, and we've talked about them a lot this semester. Kinases are going to add a phosphate to a protein, and there are three main, or three types of kinases. There's serine, threonine, and tyrosine kinases. Phosphatases are going to remove the phosphate from the protein. Now, we like to think that the minute we add a, pr a phosphate we're turning on, we take off a phosphate we're turning off. That's not always the case. The phosphate can, adding a phosphate can also turn off a protein. So it's important to understand that kinases and phosphates have their specific role, but what they do, what that hap what the product of their action is, is different depending on the protein itself and what they're doing. It. And we're going to look and see how this works in GPCRs and enzyme coupled receptors in the next two topics. So let's wrap up this topic with talking about ion channels. And ion channels, we know they can change electrochemical gradients within the cell by allowing the ions to pass through the channels. And when this is used in conjunction with those signals, essentially we're transforming a chemical signal into an electrical signal within the cell. And we talked about how this works with nerve cells. So it's important that you understand how that works. So I'd go back and check out that example again on nerve cells if you're still confused. But it's important to understand how ion channels can transform chemical signals to electrical signals. So this is the end of topic one. If you have any questions about it, please let me know. And when you are ready, go on to topic number two, which is GPCRs.